Good afternoon. I am Sylvia Nasser from the Columbia Journalism School. And I would like to uh, welcome all of you and thank you for coming. Welcome all of you to um, a wonderful event, our celebration of Marina von Neumann Whitman's memoir, The Martian's Daughter. And um, I would like to thank Jan Svenjar, David Coughlin, Geraldine from the Center for Global Economic Governance, which um, has sponsored this event with the Journalism School and the Knight Foundation. I have known Marina so long that I can't remember um, our first conversation. I'm sure that it was. Uh, I'm sure that it was an interview uh, when I was a reporter at the New York Times, and she was the chief economist at GM. Anyway, it was a long time ago, but um, we really got to know each other um, um, when um, um, I started working on a book a long time ago uh, in which her father was one of the characters. And uh, in, that, in that period, she began writing the remarkable story of her, her life. Um, and uh, she actually, she thanked me afterwards for encouraging her, but actually she was um, um, an inspiration to me um, just watching, watching her go about turning her, her life into an amazing narrative uh, because it helped me finish the book that I was working on. Um, Marina was, uh, for my generation, an amazing role model. She was one of the first women to um, make it in economics. Um, she was um, uh, someone who uh, um, uh, who had it all, who, uh, who um, had a, an amazing career, but also a great family and a wonderful marriage. Um, and she um, also um, bore this legacy of being the daughter of the greatest mathematician of the 20th century with incredible grace and very lightly. The memoir uh, which I um, saw unfold um, is, first of all, a story of, um, of what it took to succeed in a um, in an all-male profession. Marina is a graduate, got her PhD right here at Columbia in economics at a time when women were supposed to choose between a career and family and, um, and were not expected to succeed in the former. It's um, about it's also the story of someone who decided early on, as a young woman, as a you know, recent graduate of college, that she wanted it all um, in, in an age when that was not considered possible. And if you've read the article in Atlantic last year, uh, people still wonder whether it's possible. But Marina, as a 22-year-old, never doubted that it was. But most of all, Marina's memoir is the story of a father and a daughter and what they want for each other and from each other. And it's quite a touching and remarkable, remarkable uh, story from which um, I think all of us um, can see 
and, and take things from. So I would like to um, um, uh, let Jan now tell you about how he, he got to know Marina. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sylvia. It always uh, works better when people work together, and so this indeed is a joint venture, and we are very pleased that our two respective institutions can uh, sponsor this, and especially since both of us have personal links uh, with Marina. So mine goes back uh, to actually a previous uh, stage in Marina's life. I, um, uh, of course, uh, knew about Marina from uh, my graduate school days. She's an accomplished uh, economist in international trade. She's worked on uh, corporate um, governance, corporate social responsibility, many areas of economics, both uh, traditional and uh, some where she was charting um, uh, the new wave, so to speak, of, of inquiry. And uh, I uh, happened to uh, arrive at the University of uh, Pittsburgh, sort of mid-career. Uh, both my wife uh, and I had joint appointments there, and uh, in fact, it was a little bit of a kind of decision where we both wanted to have jobs together, so we always moved together and demanded that the schools either take both of us or not, and Marina was a role model in the sense of how women can accomplish. But I only started realizing what she accomplished as I was kind of going in her path, and the first footstep was that uh, the University of Pittsburgh offered me uh, the chair that Marina held until she left Pittsburgh for General Motors. So I kind of knew of her. She came back for reception and so on. And uh, I really didn't get to know her, though, until, um, again, my wife and I accepted positions at the University of Michigan, where Marina, in the meantime, came from the General Motors. She uh, reached all the way to the level of group vice president at uh, General Motors. And so Michigan was very pleased to have her, of course, uh, when she uh, concluded that chapter in her life. And we happened to coincide in the sense that our appointments were in the same schools. So Marina uh, and I served in the school of both business school at the University of Michigan and the school of public policy, the equivalent of SIPA here. And uh, the distinction or the difference being that uh, Marina is still there, I'm not. So while my <laughs> chapter is finite, she's infinite in uh, her reach and grasp and everything. Uh, but it's been you know, a wonderful uh, professional and uh, great friendship relationship that we've developed over, over the years. And I must say that she has been really indispensable, both at the level of teaching, research, but also the wisdom, I think, that uh, she imparted to the running of both schools. When there were difficult decisions, we were phasing out at one point uh, the international business uh, group at the University of uh, Michigan Business School. Many of us are against it. She shrewdly managed to extend the life of that unit for another five years and uh, virtually preserved it uh, at the time. So um, it really has been, uh, for me, a very profound sort of personal influence that Marina exerted on me. And I'm very pleased that uh, we can welcome her today here to have her uh, inaugurate her book here in New York. And, uh, and personally, I must say, I've really uh, appreciated enormously uh, the years that I've spent uh, uh, by her side, seeing and learning from her in all respects, including uh, I serve on a few boards. Marina uh, has served on many, many numerous corporate boards. And I've always learned a lot from discussing with her how one handles the difficult situations uh, at that level. So uh, let me uh, invite Marina to share with us some of her insights, and then we'll have questions and answers. And then all of us, all of you are invited for a little reception afterwards. Marina. Thank you, Gian and Sylvia, for your very generous introductions, and also to Sylvia for the wonderful foreword that she wrote to my book. And I'm grateful, of course, also to your two institutions here at Columbia who are sponsoring this event. I thought what I would do is um, read you the first five pages of the book with the prologue, which kind of tells you what the book is about. And then I'll tell a couple of stories, and then I will open things up to questions. 
but first the prologue. In September of 1956, I was sitting in the anteroom of an elegant hospital suite at Walter Reed Hospital in Bethesda, in a VIP wing reserved for the president and other high-ranking individuals, both civilian and military. I was trying to distract myself by watching Elvis Presley's gyrations on a small, fuzzy black and white TV set. But not even Elvis could calm my apprehension as I waited to be called into the hospital room where my father, the mathematician John von Neumann, lay dying of cancer, of a cancer that had by then spread throughout his body and into his brain. My father had been given this suite partly out of respect for the central role he had played, first as a key member of the Los Alamos Brain Trust that produced the atomic bomb, and later as a member of the Atomic Energy Commission and a senior advisor to several high-ranking military panels and committees, all deeply engaged in maintaining U.S. nuclear superiority in the Cold War. The more important consideration, though, was national security. Given the top secret nature of my father's involvements, absolute privacy was essential when in the early stages of his hospitalization, various top-ranking members of the military-industrial establishment sat at his bedside to pick his brain before it was too late. Vince Ford, an Air Force colonel who had been closely involved in the super-secret development of an ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, along with General Bernard Schriever and my father, was assigned as his full-time aide. Eight airmen, all with top-secret clearance, rotated around the clock. Their job was both to attend to my father's everyday needs and, in the later stages of his illness, to assure that, affected by medication or the advancing cancer, he did not inadvertently blot, blurt out military secrets. I hadn't seen my father since the spring vacation of my senior year in college the preceding April. My final exams and June graduation had been followed only a week later by my, <clears throat> by my wedding at my mother's home on Long Island, which he had been too ill to attend. Right after I changed out of my wedding gown, my new husband and I had set out for the wilds of Maine, already a day or two late for the beginning of his summer job as the director of the junior division of a boys' camp. There we had lived in our own little honeymoon cabin in the woods and had quickly become Mama and Papa Woodchuck to his eight to 10-year-old charges. And Papa Woodchuck is sitting right over there. Um, <laughs> Surrounded by the camper's energy during the day and the tranquility of the Maine woods at night, the world we had left behind seemed very far away. Now I was returning to a particularly grim reality. I had been spending the past few months on an emotional high of academic triumph and newlywed bliss. While back in Washington, my father and stepmother had been struggling every day with the disease that was destroying not only his body, but even more unbearably, his amazing mind. To compound my guilt, I knew only too well that my father had been deeply upset and disappointed by my insistence on getting married so young. He feared that such an early commitment, particularly to an impecunious young English instructor at Princeton, would thwart my own opportunities for intellectual and professional development miring me in the full-time domesticity that was expected of married women in the 1950s. In letter after letter, he often expressed in writing feelings he couldn't bring himself to talk about. My father had begged me, don't tie yourself down at such an early age, and thus throw away any chance of fulfilling your own talents. And these are direct quotes. My father had already been hospitalized and unable to walk when I had last visited him but his mind had still been in high gear. My stepmother had kept me posted during the summer regarding the inexorable advance of his illness, so I thought I was prepared. But I couldn't entirely conceal my shock when I entered the room and leaned down to kiss him. Tension and awkwardness choked my voice as I murmured, hello, daddy. He looked small and shrunken in the bed, and though he still spoke in the clipped analytical manner that had always defined him, his sentences were short and focused exclusively on his own condition. Terror of his own mortality had crowded out all other thoughts. After only a few minutes, my father made what seemed to me a very peculiar and frightening request.
from a man who was widely regarded as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, mathematician of the 20th century. He wanted me to give him two numbers, like 7 and 6 or 10 and 3, and ask him to tell me their sum. For as long as I could remember, I had always known that my father's major source of self-regard, what he felt to be the very essence of his being, was his incredible mental capacity. In this late stage of his illness, he must have been aware that this capacity was deteriorating rapidly, and the panic that that caused him was worse than any physical pain. In demanding that I test him on these elementary sums, he was seeking reassurance that at least a small fragment of his intellectual powers remained. I could only choke out a couple of these pairs of numbers and then, without even registering his answers, fled the room in tears. Months earlier, we had talked, with a candor rare for the time, about the fact that at a shockingly young age and in the midst of an extraordinarily productive life, he was going to die. But that was still a father-daughter discussion with him in the dominant role. This sudden, humiliating role reversal <clears throat> compounded both his pain and mine. After that, my father spoke very little or not at all although the doctors couldn't offer any physical reason for his retreat into silence. My own explanation was that the sheer horror of experiencing the deterioration of his mental powers at the age of 53 was too much for him to bear. Added to this pain, I feared, was my apparent betrayal of his dreams for his only child, his link to the future which was being denied to him. My father had been shaped by and then played a central role in the defining events of the first half of the 20th century. His youth was punctuated by global upheavals. Hungary had been on the defeated side in World War I and had been punished by the loss of two-thirds of its territory in the Treaty of Trianon in 1920. His family had fled in fear of their lives from a revolutionary communist government that seized power in Hungary and held it for 133 days in 1919. And he had made a prescient shift across the Atlantic as a precocious young professor of mathematics to Princeton from the University of Berlin, just as the collapse of the impoverished and embittered German nation's democratic government paved the way for Hitler's rise. Once settled in the United States, he became a key player in the Manhattan Project, which produced the atomic bomb and put an end to World War II as well as in the development of the hydrogen bomb, which sh whose shadow dominated the Cold War. His invention of game theory enabled innovative approaches to military strategy <clears throat> and gave birth to entirely new ways of analyzing and making predictions about such disparate, such dis disparate um, phenomena as business competition, diplomatic negotiations, gambling strategies, and the evolution of cancer cells. And his description of the logical architecture that underpins the modern electronic computer provided an essential base for the development of successively smaller, cheaper, and more powerful machines, up to and including the infinite variety of smart electronics that, together with the internet, have re revolutionized every aspect of modern life and human interaction. John von Neumann is often referred to as one of the Martians, five Hungarian Jewish phys physicists born in turn-of-the-century Budapest, all of whom spent most of their scientific lives in the United States and made fundamental contributions to the Allied victory in World War II. Four of them, Leo Szilard, Eugene Wigner, von Neumann, and Edward Teller, were at the forefront of developing the atomic bomb. The fifth and oldest, Theodore von Karman, was a pioneer in supersonic flight. The story goes that some of the participants in the Manhattan Project, speculating on how there came to be so many brilliant Hungarians in their midst, concluded that these colleagues were really creatures from Mars who disguised their non-human origins by speaking Hungarian, which of course nobody could understand. As this remarkable man's life was ending, I was just becoming an adult starting out on a life path that would involve me closely in some of the defining events in the second half of the 20th century. I was a pioneer in an early beneficiary of the feminist wave that swept the nation in the 60s and 70s, 
opening up new opportunities for women who dared to think that they could have it all. I ventured into economics, a field dominated by men, and climbed the academic ladder by focusing my teaching and research on the economic interdependence among nations, long before globalization had become part of our everyday vocabulary. I became the first woman on the President's Council of Economic Advisors when I was appointed by Richard Nixon, only to resign when I could no longer resist the mounting evidence that the President was implicated in covering up the Watergate scandal. I was elected as the first female member of the Board of Directors of some of the nation's most powerful companies, just as they were starting to feel pressure to invite women into their boardrooms. And I was a senior executive of General Motors during the years 1979 to 92, struggling to awaken its top management to the threats that confronted it, as the big three's dominance of the US auto industry was being relentlessly overtaken by nimbler Japanese competitors, and their inexorable decline toward disaster was underway. To some extent, my involvement in all of these events was possible because I was in the right place at the right time. But my parents, and particularly my father, also played a crucial part. The example he set by his life, the environment in which he embedded my adolescence, his expe expectations of me, and my responses to those expectations were all critical in shaping my own life. Were it not for his oft-repeated conviction that everyone, man or woman, had a moral obligation to make full use of her or his intellectual capacities, I might not have pushed myself to such a level of academic achievement or set my sights on a lifelong professional commitment at a time when society made it difficult for a woman to combine a career with family obligations. If I had not grown up in the cosmopolitan atmosphere of a family dinner table, around which gathered some of the greatest minds of the 20th century. I might have been less attuned to the economic and political relationships among nations that became the focus of my academic career. And without the example of my father's immersion in the affairs of government, I might not have felt the pull of Washington strongly enough to uproot my family and move there for three different government assignments in three, the space of three years. Yet perhaps the most powerful motivator of all was my determination to escape from the shadow of this larger-than-life parent, my desire to prove him wrong in his fear that my early marriage would thwart his hopes and ambitions for my own future. I was determined to prove that his expectations for my intellectual and professional success and my own for marriage and children with a man I had fallen in love with while still a teenager need not be mutually exclusive. With every new achievement of my life, with every barrier broken, came an overwhelming urge to say to my father, you see, I defied you by doing what I wanted, but I'm also doing what you wanted me to, after all. The evidence of his mental disintegration that overwhelmed me in that hospital room brought home the finality of my father's untimely disappearance from the scene just at the beginning of the computer age that owed so much to him. It was also the moment that catapulted me into adulthood, into a life whose shape bore the strong imprint of my heritage and the expectations it carried with it. And that is perhaps the first major theme of the book, which is essentially how does one get out from under the shadow of a larger-than-life parent and make one's own way in the world? Particularly when there appears to be a significant conflict between his expectations of me and my own expectations. And actually, the last chapter in the book is entitled, Having It All. And what I meant by that was essentially that all these apparently conflicting expectations of my father's for my intellectual and professional development, of my own for marriage and a family, of societies for the role of a woman, expected role of a woman in the 1950s, and so forth, all finally converged. And the second major theme, I think perhaps I can illustrate by telling a couple of stories. 
When my daughter and her best friend had just graduated from college, we were sitting around talking one afternoon, and one of them said to me, I guess it must have been my daughter, said, oh, come on, Mom, have things really changed all that much? There's plenty of sexism still around, and I really don't believe that it's so different than it was when you were our age. And I said, well, let me tell you a couple of stories. One was when I was a senior in college, and the interviewers began to come around, the recruiters um, looking to interview uh, graduating seniors for jobs. And one of the recruiters was from IBM, and they were recruiting for what they called sales engineers. They weren't really engineers, they were say, computer salespeople, but they had to learn enough about computers to be able to pitch them. But IBM was hiring liberal arts graduates, and these were very desirable jobs. They paid well, and they were somewhat interesting. And the recruiter and I were getting along just fine. I mean, I was first in my class, and my name was von Neumann, and so forth, until he looked at my left hand. And he said, oh, I see you're engaged. And I said, yes. He said, well, I'm sorry, but we have a policy. We don't hire engaged girls. And my daughter and her friend said, and what did you say to him, Mom? And I said, well, I don't know how to tell you this, but what I did was stand up, smooth my skirt, apologize for taking up his time, and left. Well, of course, their faces just about dropped to their knees. They were so disappointed. And I said, you don't understand. I said, he was completely within his rights. There was no EEOC. There was nobody I could complain to. I could have laid on the floor and kicked and screamed, and it wouldn't have made any difference. So they absorbed that somewhat reluctantly. And then I told him a second story. I said, when um, we were living in Princeton, Bob was teaching English at Princeton, and I, um, after a year of working in a really dead-end job at the Educational Testing Service, decided I wanted to go to graduate school, and although I hadn't majored in economics, I thought it looked like an interesting field, and that's what I wanted to go to graduate school in. And at the same time, my friend Bert Malkiel, who was famous mainly for his book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street, which is now in its seventh edition, both of us decided at the same time we wanted to go to graduate school in economics, and since we were both living in Princeton, the logical thing would be to go to Princeton. And the economics department was enthusiastic about both of us applying. But they said to me, you know, Marina, there's one little hitch you have to get over. Um, Princeton doesn't accept women for graduate study, never mind undergraduate. And so you'll have to go talk to the president. So I made an appointment with President Dodds, who was then probably in his 20th and possibly and certainly last year of the presidency. <laughs> And I said, President Dodds, I would like to get a PhD in economics here. And the economics department is enthusiastic about my application. But they said I had to talk to you about um, the fact that so far women haven't been accepted for PhDs here. And President Dodds said, well, Mrs. Whitman, uh, we are so sorry that we can't accept a student of your obvious capabilities, but we don't have housing for women students. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, that is no problem. My husband and I are living in the converted World War II barracks on the Butler Tract, which, by the way, are finally this year, after 60 years, being torn down. Um, but anyway, and so the housing problem is simply not an issue. And there was a moment's silence. And then he said, well, Mrs. Whitman, I really regret that we can't take a student of your obvious capacities but we simply don't have appropriate facilities for women students. And what he was telling me was that I couldn't get a PhD at Princeton because they didn't have enough ladies' rooms. So um, guess what? I got on the train and went to Columbia <laughs> and got my PhD here. <laughs> they were much more receptive, but I did log an awful lot of miles on the Pennsylvania Railroad. So that. I think is the other main theme that runs through this book, which is essentially, yes, Virginia, or in the case of the two young women in front of me, yes, Laura and Caroline, the world has changed. 
And it's changed really mainly as the result of a lot of effort and sacrifice by a lot of people to make it change. And do not, under any circumstances, take those changes for granted. They were hard to achieve. We could slip backward. And I think recent events have made that possibility quite clear. And you should not simply assume that this has fallen as manna from heaven, but that, in fact, um, it is quite recent origin within the adult lifetime of someone is, who is still here and reasonably coherent. And uh, just please don't take it for granted. So that, I think, is the second thing I am trying to bring out in this book. And I'm hoping that among the readership will be quite a number of younger people. Uh, maybe m many of them will be women, but I hope not all, uh, who will take that lesson to heart. So after that, at the risk of becoming preachy, um, let me open up the floor to any and all questions. And maybe I'll come and take questions from yeah. over here. There is a microphone here if you'd like to stand there and address the um, I was surprised to uh, that here you mention uh, that your uh, Professor von Neumann was also a consultant to the development of the hydrogen bomb? Uh, or did I get that wrong? What well, was his relationship? I'm, I'm not sure. I think, and, and I have to say that, you know, I was a teenager and not paying huge amounts of attention. But wasn't the development of the hydrogen bomb going, sort of overlapping with the development of the atomic bomb? And I'm not sure that you could make very clear distinctions between the two. And it seems to me that a good deal of the technology that was involved in one was also involved in the other. The questioner, my old friend Margaret Beals, her father, who was actually for many, many years a noted professor here at Columbia, I.I. Arabi, we grew up together. Um, in the shadow of all those World War II developments. So I may be wrong, but it seems to me that it was a little hard, except in the case of Edward Teller, who was such a strong proponent of the hydrogen bomb, to draw a clear, bright line on the contributions between the one and the other. Oh, yes. You might just say who you are for the benefit of the audience. My name's Amy Augustus. I'm with the Women's Economic Roundtable at the Knight Badgett Fellowship Program, and it's a privilege to ask you a question. I missed the first half because I was caught in a police action on the subway, so oh. if I'm asking the wrong <laughs> question, just ignore me. And this goes back to the women's issue. Two things. One will sound ridiculous, which is okay. I still would like to hear you comment. And the second one I'm earnest about. Do you think, because I, this question bombarded us when we started the round table, that women economists have a different point of view on economics from men? That's question one. Second one is, in your professional career and also a, a, which includes being a professor, did you find, what were any, were there any constraints as being the woman economist in a room filled with primarily men? Thank you. Well, let me tackle the second one first, because in a way it's easier. Uh, no, as a professor, I have to say I didn't feel any constraints. I, I will, give you an example 
uh, one occasion where this came up, which is another sort of silly story in my book, which is that when I had just finished my PhD, uh, we had just moved to Pittsburgh, and I was hired to teach an evening course at the University of Pittsburgh, and these evening courses were attended largely by people who had worked all day and then were doing work for one degree or another in the evening. And I think I was maybe 25 years old. And most of the people who attended these evening classes were significantly older than me. So I was not only a woman, but I was also a very young woman. And I remember uh, as I was standing up at the lectern, sort of waiting for time for class to begin, a middle-aged man uh, said to me, excuse me, but are you the teacher? And I said, yes, I'm Professor Whitman, blah, blah. And he said, oh, he said, this will take a bit of adjusting. You see, at US Steel, we don't pay women to think. And then, of course, he realized what he blurted out, and he was covered with embarrassment and tried to backtrack. And I'm sure that he, was sh that he felt that the C he got in the course was due to that unfortunate remark, which he, well, it was well, it was well earned. And the truth is, he was simply stating a fact. Um, it wasn't, you know, it didn't come out of his own mind. This was the way things were in Pittsburgh. And when did we go to Pittsburgh, 1960? Yeah. Um, the question is, do women economists think differently? That's hard, you know, because economic, economists are not a homogeneous group in any case. I mean, you know, uh, you put, put three economists in a room and you'll get four opinions, and that's probably true. So I think it's very hard to say that women economists as a group think differently from male economists as a group because um, there is so much within cell variants as well as between cell variants, if I can put it that way. Uh, I have a two-part question. Um, first of all, having to do with the uh, other men in your class, because I was the only woman in my architecture class in the mm -hmm. early 1960s, and I was actually by a certain group of them um, the charismatic ones, mocked and bombarded. So I'm wondering if you have that uh, um, effect as well. I guess not. <laughs> uh, and the other thing is, um, the other issue is um, wondering about um, the uh, possible second black mark that you had against you in at your time being in big industry. Um, and that was uh, being Jewish. Um, in a WASP world? Well, uh, let me see. Oh, your first question was, did I ever encounter overt hostility? And the answer is, frankly, no. I can't say. Um, I al always had good relations with at least uh, most of my male colleagues, and the others were just neutral, as is always the case. But. Uh, the kind of hostility you met, no. Interestingly enough, um, 40 years later, when my daughter was in medical school, she did meet some of that. Uh, but I guess I was just lucky I didn't. Secondly, your question about being Jewish. Well, I, I was born to ethnically Jewish parents, baptized a Catholic, and gr raised an Episcopalian. So, <laughs> as a friend of mine says, everybody can claim me, or if they prefer, no one. And uh, I, I don't think people at General Motors knew or cared, in all honesty. Um, I was married to the Mayflower, and my, and my name was Whitman. And I, I just don't think the issue particularly entered their heads. What, what clearly they did regard me, and as again, I did not encounter overt hostility unless you count the wolf whistles and catcalls that I got when I walked through plants. Uh, but among uh, the executive ranks, 
um, except for one vice president who reported to me, who told me very candidly that he found it very difficult to report to a woman, but he would do his best. Um, such difficulties as I encountered were much more subtle. And actually, what I discovered later was I ultimately left GM in sheer frustration because I couldn't persuade enough of the people that counted that if the company didn't change its ways drastically, it was headed toward destruction. I discovered later that my problem in not being convincing was not so much gender. It was being an outsider. Roger Smith, to his credit, hired a bunch of outsiders from, as vice presidents who were already at the top of their profession somewhere else, both men and women. And every single one of us left or retired frustrated because we couldn't make that impact. So while certainly um, my gender made me kind of a third sex, I mean, I clearly wasn't a man, but I wasn't anything like the women they knew either. Um, I, I don't think it was the main problem that I encountered. It was rather coming in from outside and not having grown up in the industry. Thank you very much for coming today. And I can't wait to read this book. But I wonder, could you say a little bit about uh, the nature of your father's sparkling intellect and how you experienced it and uh, how it influenced you? Um, well, I experienced it in a way only indirectly. That is, I had neither the interest nor the capacity to discuss mathematics with my father. And the one time I asked him to help me with my homework, and it ended up in one of those things with me saying, but Daddy, that's not how the teacher does it. <laughs> and after that, he kind of retreated from the field. Um, I was aware that he was brilliant. Um, and interestingly enough, his brilliance was obvious to me in more peripheral ways. He was an absolute expert on Byzantine history, for example, and his, his Byzantine historians didn't like to get into discussions with him because he usually won. Furthermore, at some point, although maybe later than seems sensible, I became aware of the way the world regarded him. And as I say, eventually, um, this brilliance was part of the hold he had on me and his expectations of me, which might or might not have had as much impact if he hadn't been as brilliant. And I have to say, one of the things I take away from that relationship with my father is that I'm very well aware of the difference between merely being very bright, which most of my family is, and being a genius. And there is a world of difference. And one shouldn't confuse one with the other. Professor Whitman, thank you. Uh, my name is Yao Zhang, a doctoral student in economics and education here. Um, um, the book is about you and, and also a, a lot of chapters dedicated to your father, but I'm actually curious, what are the impacts from your mother and how the like dynamic or relationship with your parents actually is sh um, shaping your personality as well? Yeah, because my mother was quite a remarkable person in her own right, although she doesn't figure in this prologue. My parents were divorced when I was two and a half. So I have no memory of them as a family. I remember them as distinct individuals in two different households. My mother was intimidating in a very different way. She was, she was very glamorous. She was what the French call a jolie laid. Um, if you took her feature by feature, she was actually quite homely. But the overall imp impact, she was so vivacious, so elegant, that she seemed like a beauty. And she could charm the birds out of trees. There is no question. And she spent much of her life uh, at Brookhaven National Laboratory. And I don't even remember what her title was. But she was really sort of chief diplomat for Brookhaven Laboratory. And I think she very much hoped 
that her little awkward, ugly duckling would grow into a swan one of these days. But she clearly also had her doubts. I still remember um, when I was about, a when I was a teenager, and I was going to some dance, which at that point was very important in my life. And I was kind of an awkward, somewhat overweight teenager, and I just had a dreadful case of poison ivy, so I was kind of scaly. And my mother was doing her very best. She really was. She made me up, and she fixed my hair, and she bought me a really pretty dress. I can still see that dress in my mind's eye. And when she was all done with her ministrations, she put me against the opposite wall and studied her handiwork and said, Jesus Christ, I'm glad I'm not 16. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret remembers my mother. <laughs> Everybody loved my mother, and I loved my mother. But my brother and I exchanged somewhat wry comments on the fact that my mo his parents, my mother and stepfather, achieved the incredible of making each one of us feel inferior to the other. Um, <laughs> He was, was always taxed with my academic achievements, and I was always taxed with his social graces and the fact that he excelled in any sport that he undertook. In our adulthood, we've become extremely good friends, but let me tell you, it was a pretty competitive childhood. But yes, she did have also, and she, by the way, also uh, went to work during World War II as a kind of Tilly the Toiler, you know, welding things. And people said to her, oh, come on. Um, you know, you're all just a socialite who'll quit as soon as you're bored. Well, within three months, she was a foreman. Within six months, she was running the whole training of female technicians at Radiation Laboratory, which was run by MIT during the war. And she never looked back. So she kind of made up her own career as she went along. So that also, um, in her own way, was a role model for me. I think we've got to let one male get in this little matriarchy here. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better male, Paul Volcker, than you to well, introduce I, the males. I once had an uh, experience of working with Marina on more than one occasion. I want you to know she was never hostile to me. Never. That is absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> He's but always she, been a good friend. She describes uh, uh, a big change in the environment for females and others. I begin wondering, Marina, if this momentum continues, what role males will have in the next generation? I, <laughs> I, women always have a certain function that's indispensable, but I, uh, I'm a little bit worried. But I, I just want to say, I have read this book. I had the pleasure of reading this book some time ago. And you have a little taste of it, obviously. Uh, I certainly do. One of the finest encomiums or encomia I ever had is from Paul Volcker on the back of this book. That's not true. But I, uh, it really is a fascinating book. I, I often think that some of my friends have such interesting backgrounds. I could never write a memoir about myself. My, my life's been so dull. But this yeah, is, yeah, yeah. This is an undull life. <laughs> <laughs> you have uh, no, already discovered. I mean, it's a fascinating life. Uh, socially, but professionally as well, and your struggles with general motives, I think, are characteristic of the old school of industry. I'm not sure you find a different reception, I think, in general motives. Oh, today, yes. Whether oh, or yes. Male, probably less male. But I, did, I just want to say, uh, uh, you know, I began reading this book because I did put a, sometimes you write a blog for a book without reading it particularly, but I began reading this. <laughs> and I read it. <laughs> yes, he did. And I recommend it to all of you. Don't be satisfied with this little recitation, which was fascinating in yourself. Marina, uh, I don't know where you draw the line between great talent and genius. Uh, but some of that genius has rubbed off in various ways. And I just want to say that and get out of here and let all these other people read the book. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Boy, what an endorsement. By the way, when I last learned biology, which I have to admit was in the ninth grade, I seem to remember that men had a fairly crucial role as well. <laughs> <laughs> hmm?
on the nose at three o'clock. <laughs> oh, is there? Oh, oh yeah. Hi, um, I'm Jana. I'm finishing my PhD in economics here. Uh, it's a little bit personal question for me. Um, I lost both my parents very early, um, especially my mom, who was larger than life. Um, she died before I finished my undergraduate studies. And uh, when that happened, I thought, well, thank goodness, at least, you know, we didn't have any conflicts. We always, we will always be, um, we will always, um, we would always negotiate. And uh, she was a very accomplished academic. And she also was, you know, a very successful woman in a way that she had family, you know, great husband and two kids. Um, and then, you know, I kind of let her go with that thought that, you know, there were no conflict and I knew that she loved me and it was a great relationship. But then seven years later, I realized, you know, I kind of need her now because um, you get older, you get, you know, more life experience and you face situations where you're at a loss and what you knew with her, you know, you cannot really take that and apply to the age when you're 20 versus 27, for example. So um, I want to ask you, how did you, you know, put those pieces together um, of your father's life? How would you think about him when you faced a very tough situation? Um, because obviously you also lost him when you were mm -hmm. a young adult and you kn knew him, you know, the same act when you think about it as a teenager versus as an adult, you know, how did you put those things together? And also, um, how do you talk about him to your children and to your grandchildren? Yeah. <clears throat> well, again, let me tackle the second question first. Um, I think my own children may actually have learned more about my father from reading this book than they ever knew before. Although we had talked about it and they certainly knew about his achievements and actually our son who um, is a molecular biologist on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School was once planning to write a joint article with Stanislaw Ulam who was a mathematician of my father's generation and my father's closest friend. Now, it didn't happen. Stan Ulam died unexpectedly shortly thereafter. But I think my son in particular had a pretty reasonable understanding. And, and my daughter too, although it's a little less close to, she's a physician, a, a practicing internist. My grandchildren, <laughs> I think, no, and they have not yet read this book. I'm hoping sooner or later, what, well, I guess my granddaughter, the younger one, has started to because she told me she was writing a report in school. Actually, the, the requirement was to write about some immigrant in your family. And so she's writing about, um, I, I can't remember whether it's, it's my father or both my father and my mother. This is in the eighth grade. My grandson hasn't sat down yet to read it. He's 16 and has other things on his mind, and I don't know when he'll get to it. His response so far was when he saw the dedication, which is to my grandchildren, and it says, on whom the hope of the world as always depends. And my grandson's 16-year-old response was, oh, Grammy, the pressure. <laughs> So your question about my father, well, I think my main response is the one that I ended up that prologue with, with essentially wishing terribly that he had lived long, and very selfishly, that he had lived long enough to see that I could fulfill his expectations and mine both. And um, I also, of course, feel a great sense of a very productive life cut short. He had intended, um, after he left the Atomic Energy Commission, which he was a member of when he died, to go and be a professor at Caltech 
and go back to the kind of mathematics that he had done in the early part of his life before he got sucked into the military industrial establishment. He also, with his friend Oscar Morgenstern, was going to found a company called Mathematica because he decided for the sake of his family it was about time he finally made some money. And Morgenstern did go ahead and found Mathematica, and as many of you know, it's a very successful consulting firm. But he never had time to do any of these things. And I think that he had a sense of enormous frustration that he was being cut off in, in midlife. And so I have often wished also that he could have had more time, which heaven knows he would have made better use of than, than most of us. So those are kind of uh, scattered answers, but that's about the best I can do. Well, maybe this is the time to uh, yes. turn so informal. I think we'll, um, um, you know, it's going to do a book signing. I want to thank you again for, for coming, and um, please join us in the reception. Thank you.